the early 1900s, diphtheria was a deadly disease that killed millions of children. But thanks to the work of Emil von Behring and Shibasa Buro Kitasato, a diphtheria vaccine was developed and the disease was virtually eradicated. In this video, we will explore the story of how these two scientists made history. In 1878, a German physician graduated from the Humboldt University of Berlin, then called the Kaiser Wilhelm Academy. His name, Emil von Behring. He became a doctorate with a dissertation entitled Recent Observations on Optical Ciliary Neurotomy. In 1901, this scientist would become the first recipient of the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology. Bering was awarded this prize for his work on serum therapy, especially its application against diphtheria, by which he has opened a new road in the domain of medical science and thereby placed in the hands of the physician a victorious weapon against illness and death. Emil von Behring was born in 1854 to a family of 13 children where the father of the household was a prestigious schoolmaster. When Emil became 20 years old, between 1874 and 1878, he studied medicine at the Kaiser Wilhelm Academy, an academy for military doctors as his family could ill afford university. As a military doctor, he would study the action of iodoform, a disinfectant used in medicine as a healing and antiseptic dressing for wounds and sores. Stating that, iodoform does not kill microbes but may neutralize the poisons given off by them, thus being antitoxic. His first publications on these questions appeared in 1882. This research would later make an impact into his Nobel Prize winning work on utilizing serum therapy to treat diphtheria, where iodoform treated diphtheria toxin would be injected into animals to protect them from disease. In modern day practice, most applications of iodoform have been replaced with superior antiseptic chemicals and concoctions. However, iodoform is still utilized in ENT medicine in the form of bismuth subnitrate iodoform paraffin paste, or BIPP for short, as an antiseptic packing for cavities. He would also go on to perform a series of experiments on optociliary neurotomy, also known as Neurotomia opticociliaris, a surgical procedure that severs the optic nerve, the nerve that connects the eye to the brain. He was interested in the potential of this procedure to treat glaucoma, a condition that causes raised intraocular pressure, that is to say, increased pressure within the eye. This would typically involve placing the patient under general anesthesia, making a small incision in the sclera, the white outer layer of the eye, the optic nerve is then severed, and the incision is then closed. The recovery from optociliary neurotomy is typically slow and can take several months. There is also a risk of complications such as infection, bleeding and damage to other eye structures. Today, optociliary neurotomy is not a recognized surgical procedure and is not performed due to being risky and having major side effects, most notably blindness and pain, as well as the availability of superior medical and surgical treatments for glaucoma, such as the use of these four options. Timolol eye drops, which are a non-selective beta blocker used in open angle glaucoma, to reduce the production of aqueous humor, the fluid that fills the eye. Pilocarpine eye drops, a parasympathetic muscarinic agonist used for closed angle glaucoma, causing ciliary muscle contraction and increasing the outflow of aqueous humor into the trabecular meshwork. Trabeculotomy, a surgical procedure that creates a new drainage pathway for aqueous humor by making a small incision into the trabecular meshwork with a recovery time of two to four weeks. And finally, laser trabeculoplasty, a less invasive procedure than a regular trabeculectomy. It involves using a laser to create tiny holes in the trabecular meshwork with a recovery time of one to two weeks. However, Bering's work on optociliary neurotomy was not entirely without merit. His experiments helped to shed light on the mechanisms of glaucoma and the role of the optic nerve in the disease. His findings also led to the development of other surgical treatments for glaucoma, such as trabeculotomy and laser trabeculoplasty. Bering's Nobel Prize would be awarded for his work on creating a novel treatment for children who contracted diphtheria. This would help children to survive the disease and make it into adulthood. Diphtheria is a serious respiratory illness caused by the bacterium Cornibacterium diphtheriae. The bacterium produces a toxin that can damage the heart, nerves and other organs. Diphtheria is spread through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes. Symptoms of diphtheria typically appear 2-5 to five days after infection. Early symptoms include fever, sore throat and difficulty swallowing. A thick grey-white membrane may form on the tonsils, pharynx or nose. This membrane can block the airway and make it difficult to breathe. 
Other symptoms of diphtheria can include swollen neck, rash, weakness, fatigue, muscle pain, headache, and loss of appetite. Note, diphtheria can be fatal, especially in children. Emil von Behring identified that upon contracting diphtheria, many patients were able to develop a successful immune response and recover. He would try to gather the serum from these patients with the hope of isolating what was then referred to as the antitoxin, producing diphtheria antitoxin serum, and then inject these into humans. As a result of only being able to collect a pint of potentially life-saving diphtheria antitoxin serum from each patient, Emil von Behring and his colleagues used horses and sometime later sheep as a source of diphtheria antitoxin. Using sheep allowed the production of comparable levels of the diphtheria antitoxin, yet sheep were of smaller size and easier to handle. Note, you will find that the term antitoxin is used throughout this video as this was the term that was used in Bering's research. What was essentially injected into these patients, the so-called antitoxin, was in fact simply blood plasma, albeit without the clotting factors as the blood was allowed to clot before blood plasma was collected. However, this antitoxin still contained the disease-specific antibodies, which is what we believe was actually treating these patients. So, from where did Bering even get the diphtheria toxin to inject into sheep, horses and finally humans? as these were the very early days of immunology, with Louis Pasteur only having just invented pasteurization in 1864, 24 years prior to Bering beginning his lab work on serum therapy in 1888. So in 1888, at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, Emile Roux and Alexander Yersin isolated diphtheria toxin using a series of experiments. First, they grew cultures of Cornibacterium diphtheria, then they filtered the cultures to remove the bacteria, leaving behind a filtrate that contained the toxin. Next, they injected the filtrate into animals and they observed that the animals developed symptoms of diphtheria. This showed that the filtrate contained the toxin that was causing the disease. Finally, they purified the toxin by passing it through a series of columns that contained different materials. This process removed other proteins and impurities from the toxin, leaving behind a pure form of the toxin. The isolation of the diphtheria toxin was a major breakthrough, and it paved the way for the development of serum therapy against diphtheria. Here are the steps in more detail. The isolation of the diphtheria toxin was a complex and challenging process, but it was ultimately successful. This discovery led to the development of serum therapy within the very same year, which saved millions of lives. The production of antitoxins involved drawing blood from a vein of a horse via venipuncture, placing it into a glass bottle, spinning these samples at very high speeds in a centrifuge so the lighter fluids rose to the top, called a supernatant, rich in the desired antitoxins, and the heavier fluids settled to the bottom, called the pellet, which was to be discarded. These serums would then be treated with various chemical agents such as ammonium sulfate, sodium chloride, hydrochloric acid, sodium hydroxide, and other reagents. Ammonium sulfate, used for protein precipitation, removing unwanted proteins and impurities from the serum. Sodium chloride, also known as common table salt, employed to maintain an osmotic balance or promoting protein solubility. Hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide to help adjust the pH of the solution, as well as other reagents, which can include buffers, enzymes or substances required for specific biochemical assays or reactions. He later determined the minimum effective dose of antitoxin to help standardize the antitoxin vials that were airtight, sterile, inexpensive to produce, easy to label, and store. These were to be placed into mass production and consequently administered onto patients, a standard that would be adopted in vaccine development. By establishing a consistent potency, dosage, and safety regulations of serum therapies, Bering helped to improve the reliability and effectiveness of serum therapies achieving a standardization of serums. Serum therapy and vaccines are both medical interventions that can help protect people from infectious diseases. However, they work in different ways. Serum therapy involves injecting antibodies from an animal that has been immunized against a specific disease into a person who is not immune. The antibodies in the serum attach to the disease causing microorganisms and help to kill them. Vaccines work by stimulating the body's own immune system to produce antibodies against a specific disease. This is done by injecting the person with a weakened or inactive form of the disease-causing organism. The body's immune system then recognizes the microorganism as a threat and produces antibodies to tackle it. Here is a table that summarizes the key differences between serum therapy and vaccines. 
Serum therapy is typically used to treat people who are already sick with a disease, while vaccines are used to prevent people from getting sick in the first place. Therapy can be effective in treating some diseases, but is not always available and can have side effects. Vaccines are generally safe and well tolerated, and they can provide long-term protection against many diseases. In general, vaccines are considered to be the best way to protect people from infectious diseases. However, serum therapy may be used in some cases such as when a person is exposed to a disease for which there is no vaccine or when a person is too sick to receive a vaccine. Bering's discovery showed that it was possible to transfer antibodies from one animal to another. Although Bering has often been credited with being the founder of serum therapy in 1891, in truth, he is the co-founder. Diphtheria serum therapy was invented following the same principles of a prior serum therapy, that for tetanus serum therapy, as co-invented by Japanese bacteriologist Kitasato Shibasaburo and Emil von Bering in 1890. The two developments being closely linked, Kitasato's efforts helped lay the groundwork for Emil von Bering's work on diphtheria serum therapy. Kitasato was born in Okuni village, Higo province, that is present-day Oguni town, Kumamoto prefecture, Kyushu, as son of a village head and Tei, the daughter of a samurai. His parents were strict about education and sent him to a relative's home and requested rigid discipline, and is said to have inherited his leadership qualities from his mother. He was educated at Kumamoto Medical School and Tokyo Imperial University. He then studied under Robert Koch at the University of Berlin from 1885 to 1891. Robert Koch being regarded as one of the main founders of modern bacteriology, who was a German physician and microbiologist who discovered the specific causative agents of deadly infectious diseases including tuberculosis, cholera and anthrax. Note, although the cholera bacterium was discovered by Filippo Pacini in 1854, in 1889, Kitasato became the first person to successfully grow tetanus bacillus in pure culture, this being a critical step in the development of a tetanus antitoxin. In 1890, he would cooperate with Emil von Bering to develop a serum therapy for tetanus in pure culture, pioneering the way for the new field of serum therapy. Tetanus is a serious, potentially fatal illness caused by the bacterium Clostridium tetani. The bacteria produces a toxin that affects the nervous system, causing muscle spasms and stiffness. Tetanus bacteria are found in soil and dust, and they can enter the body through a break in the skin. Common ways tetanus gets into your body include stepping on nails or other sharp objects, cuts or scrapes that are dirty or contaminated with dirt or feces, puncture wounds, and burns. Tetanus is often called lockjaw because one of the most common symptoms is tightening of the jaw muscles. After returning to Japan in 1891, he founded the Institute for Study of Infectious Diseases with the assistance of Fukuzawa Yukichi, a Japanese educator, philosopher, writer, entrepreneur and samurai. One of his early assistants was August von Wasermann, a German bacteriologist and hygienist who developed a complement fixation test for the diagnosis of syphilis in 1906, just one year after the causative organism Spirochyta pallida had been identified, also known as the Wasserman test, allowing for the early detection of the disease. It was here that Kitasato demonstrated how dead cultures can be used in vaccination and studied the mode of infection in tuberculosis. Three years later, in 1894, he would travel to Hong Kong at the request of the Japanese government, during an outbreak of bubonic plague and identified the causative bacterium. Yersin, working separately, would find the same organism several days later. Four years later, in 1898, Kitasato and his student Shiga Kayoshi were able to isolate and describe the organism that caused dysentery. He would play a significant role in several other achievements and work with several medical scientists over the years, becoming the first dean at Keio University, first president of the Japanese Medical Association, and served on the household peers in Japan. He is to be commemorated in the new 1,000 yen banknotes scheduled to be issued in 2024. By conducting multiple experiments, Bering and Shiba Saburo demonstrated the concept of passive immunization. By administering antitoxin serum, also known as ready-made antibodies or B-cells, to individuals, he demonstrated that it could provide temporary immunity or reduce the severity of the infection. This can occur naturally when maternal antibodies are transferred to the fetus through the placenta or induced artificially via immunoglobulin therapy or antiserum therapy. Passive immunity is still used today when people cannot synthesize antibodies and when they have been exposed to a disease that they do not have immunity against, for example rabies and snake bite. 
Prior to Bering's discovery, diphtheria was a highly fatal disease. The mortality rate for diphtheria was as high as 50%, and many survivors were left with permanent disabilities. Bering's serum therapy was able to significantly reduce the mortality rate for diphtheria to 15%, and it also helped to prevent many cases of the disease. Although this was not without its side effects, as there were allergic reactions to be wary of, the most common allergic reactions to the diphtheria antitoxin serum included urticaria or hives, angioedema, that is to say swelling of the face, lips, tongue or throat, and anaphylaxis, a severe allergic reaction that can be life-threatening. A patient with a history of allergies, just as we do today, was required to tell their doctor of any history of allergic reactions before being considered for diphtheria antiserum treatment. Today we use a modern subtype of plasma therapy, referred to as convalescent plasma therapy. Convalescent plasma therapy. Convalescent, meaning when a person is recovering after an illness or medical treatment. Plasma, referring to the part of blood which contains and transports antibodies, clotting factors, urea and CO2. This plasma typically rises to the top when blood is centrifuged at high speeds. Therapy, treatment intended to relieve or heal a disorder. Convalescent plasma therapy is a subtype of serum therapy that is the modern standard. Traditional serum therapy is rich in antibodies targeting a specific infection as the serum is attained from a previously infected patient with a successful immune response, but lacks clotting factors as these would disrupt absorption of the antibodies within the plasma. Convalescent plasma therapy involves antibody-rich plasma but is also rich in clotting factors due to the addition of anticoagulants which helps to assist in wound healing and prevent the formation of blood clots. Convalescent plasma therapy has been used to some degree of success to treat an array of diseases since 1890 until today, as can be seen in this diagram, where the serum, or blood plasma, that is rich in antibodies to help fight the infection, also retains the clotting factors involved in wound healing and regeneration. Due to the treatment of the blood plasma with anticoagulants, namely heparin, due to its low cost, high efficacy, and reversibility of use. Convalescent plasma therapy helped significantly reduce the severity of several national epidemics and global pandemics. The most prominent and is often thought to be the first reported use of convalescent plasma therapy was in treating a global pandemic in the years of 1918 to 1920. The Spanish influenza A or H5N1 pneumonia pandemic, also known as the Spanish flu pandemic, where a 2006 meta-analysis study of 1,703 patients from eight suitable reports of Spanish flu found that treatment with convalescent serum therapy cut fatality rates by over a half from 37% in controls who weren't treated to 16% in those who were treated. Although there were mild adverse events reported in each of the studies of their meta-analysis, which included brief chill reactions and exacerbation of existing symptoms, with the rates of chill reaction being reported as 16%, 75% or 10% depending on the study formed. However, the serotherapy from convalescent patients had been long used even before the Spanish influenza pandemic. For instance, it was tried as a medical treatment for acute paralysis in the 1916 New York outbreak of poliomyelitis, a disabling and life-threatening disease caused by the polio virus that spreads from person to person and can infect a person's spinal cord, causing paralysis, mainly affecting children under 5 years of age. It was tried again in 1916. Nicole and Consal applied serotherapy to contain a small measles epidemic in Tunis. In 1915, Hess used the same therapeutic option to treat mumps and prevent its testicular complications. Although it can be dated much earlier to an article published in 1907 via the Italian Pediatric Journal, where the public health doctor Francesco Senchi is the first to use convalescent serum as a therapeutic tool to protect children exposed to measles infection. While working in a small town of central Italy near Perugia in Campello Sol Clituna, with about 1,800 inhabitants in the early 20th century, he observed that once cured of measles, it was unlikely a patient would fall ill a second time, thus presuming some serum protective factor. Three weeks after a 20-year-old man had recovered from an epidemic outbreak in 1901, Senki performed a bloodletting of 600 milliliters on this man, and after allowing blood to coagulate, he collected serum in three sterilized tubes, adding a solution of phenic acid, which is a disinfectant, as a protective agent. This convalescent serum was then used to inoculate four children between the ages of four and eight years old, who did not contract measles after his treatment, unlike their cohabitant siblings. In order to ensure safety of the product, 60 hours prior to administration to patients, a portion of serum was inoculated into the peritoneum of a rabbit and also into the arm of Senki himself, without this causing general or local reactions. 
In December 1906, there was another outbreak of measles in the Campello Sul Cucino area with about 40 sick children. Senki successfully repeated his preventative treatment of convalescent serum inoculations of children, with a notable case of a child with a severe form of measles, where pneumonia seal therapy made the infection milder and duration of the disease shorter. This case unequivocally demonstrated not only the preventative use of convalescent serum, but also the therapeutic uses of convalescent serum, perhaps even for the very first time. Senki had reported that a similar treatment had been made on two children in 1900. In the Pediatric Clinic of Rome, which was directed by Luigi Consetti, who was the first to use serotherapy against diphtheria in Italy after the seminal studies by Emil Bering and Shibasaburo Kitasato. This therapeutic innovation of convalescent serum inoculations in children was soon put into practice at Campello Sol Cutuno, suggesting not only an already good public health system, but also the idea that a rural village, as opposed to an academic or research center, was pioneering the adoption of a novel medical technology. This preventative treatment of convalescent serum therapy lasted for several decades as measles had a high mortality of 67% in some populations. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic that began in Wuhan, China in December 2019, convalescent plasma therapy was trialled by various research scientists across the world. In addition to the existing strategies being used to treat the world pandemic, for example human behaviour, vaccine development via mRNA, convalescent plasma therapy, stem cell therapy and antiviral drugs. Six small-scale studies from 2020, within a year of the pandemic having begun, helped to confirm the safety of convalescent plasma therapy on varying sample sizes of hospitalised adults with severe or life-threatening COVID-19 where the incidence of serious adverse events were found to be less than 1% and nearly all patients were successfully discharged or recovered from the COVID-19 infection. In study 1, all 5 critically ill patients with COVID-19 and ARDS showed improvement in their clinical status upon the administration of convalescent plasma. In study 2, all 4 patients, including a pregnant woman, recover. In study 3, 10 severe patients enrolled, confirmed via real-time viral RNA tests. 7 patients had undetectable viral load after 3 days. No adverse events than any of the patients. In study 4, there were two patients, both had improved. Study 5, six patients, all ground glass opacities were resolved, immediate rise in antibody titers in patient 2 and patient 3, but not in patient 1. The study served to prove convalescent plasma therapy is indeed a promising state-of-the-art therapy to use during the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, in study 6, there were six patients treated 21.5 days as a median after viral load was first detected. Five patients eventually died, teaching us that convalescent plasma therapy cannot reduce the mortality rate in critically ill patients with N stage COVID-19 and treatment should be initiated earlier. Although convalescent plasma therapy has been proven safe for severe COVID-19 patients and even in immunocompromised patients, it has not been proven to be effective. On 7th December 2021, the 7th update of the WHO guidelines for the use of therapeutics in the treatment of COVID-19 was released with 12 updates so far as of the upload date of this video. The 7th update recommended against the use of convalescent plasma therapy on severe and critical COVID-19 patients. The World Health Organization claimed, and I quote, while the evidence that convalescent plasma has no benefit in non-severe patients was certain, it was less so in the case of severe and critically ill patients. So randomized clinical trials for these subgroups should continue. WHO stated that an independent panel of experts looked at pooled data from 16 randomized controlled trials, including 16,236 patients with non-severe, severe, and critical cases of COVID-19 infection. Although it would appear that this WHO study was not published into the public domain, and we have to take their word for it that convalescent plasma therapy isn't effective in even mild COVID-19 patients, which is unfortunate. Considering there exist early small-scale studies that do support the fact that convalescent plasma therapy can improve the prognosis for COVID-19 patients as earlier described, leaving those of us who have been following the WHO's response to the global COVID-19 crisis wanting for increased transparency. WHO guidelines states that efforts for COVID-19 therapy are better utilized on utilizing antivirals such as Nermatrolvir and Ritonavir, corticosteroids, interleukin-6 receptor blockers and the JAK inhibitor baricitinib, correct as of 13th January 2023. Ultimately, convalescent serum therapy was indeed found to be safe to use even in severe and critical COVID-19 patients, as corroborated by the World Health Organization. With the rationale for whose recommendation against its use was due to the processes of identification of recruitment of potential donors, collection of plasma, storage and distribution of plasma, infusion of convalescent plasma into recipients, all being resource intensive and time consuming considering the inevitable health care. 
reflecting on Bering's work of 1901. Bering's work was not without its critics. Some people argued that serum therapy was not a reliable or effective treatment. However, the work of Bering and colleagues was ultimately vindicated and serum therapy became a standard treatment for diphtheria and tetanus. Bering and Tsubasa were both humble and generous men. They were always willing to share their knowledge with others and were always looking for ways to improve the lives of others. ML von Bering and Shibasaburo were brilliant scientists and true pioneers in the field of medicine. The work that gave rise to serum therapy was thanks to a combination of efforts by various figures, which included but was not restricted to ML von Bering, Kitasato Shibasaburo, Paul Ehrlich, Eric Arthur Emanuel Wernicke, ML Rue, Alexander Yersin, and Robert Koch, among others, which all helped to save countless lives and make the world a healthier place. These individuals are a true inspiration to all who follow in their footsteps. Thank you for listening to this video essay on Emil von Bering. If you liked it, be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you learned anything new or have any questions, ask away in the comments below.